I kind of wish I knew more about the health and safety industry earlier in my career. Um, Cause when I got into the health and safety field, I, I didn't even know what it was. I got into it because my dad had sent me a job posting when I was moving back to my hometown and uh, it was an industrial hygienist position. He's like, Hey, look, you just got a bachelor's degree in biology. You should apply for this. And I'm like, what's industrial hygiene. <laughs> and so um, I kind of wish I knew a little bit more about it because, you know, in hindsight, I'm able to use some of my education to to benefit my career. But at the time, you know, there's, I remember learning about hexavalent chromium and organic chemistry class. And, and I didn't really have a way of kind of putting it into real life, you know, and now we deal with it every day. So for those of you who are listening, we are here having a conversation with Giovanni Medili, and he is the health and safety manager at VNS Federal Services. So let's dive back into the conversation, Giovanni. And I like what you're saying, you know, that you wish at the start of your career, you had a better idea of what health and safety actually was. So yeah. share a little bit more about when you first learned about health and safety, because for myself, I wasn't until about 35 years old until I actually knew there was a thing called health and safety in the workplace. Yeah, I mean, we'll go back to when I first was getting an undergraduate degree. Um, I was at Gonzaga University, go Bulldogs. And uh, I wanted to be a doctor, just like a lot of other people that were um, getting a science degree. And um ultimately that didn't pan out. And so I was going to move back to my hometown and my dad, he works at the Hanford facility, which is, a, it's a, it was originally commissioned in the forties. It was part of a Manhattan project effort. It's a big facility out here. And at the time they had, they had started it or built it um, to provide the plutonium for the atomic bombs used in the war efforts. And so now it's a, it's kind of in the decommissioning cleanup phase um, so there's thousands of people employed out here. My dad's worked out here for a long time. And so he had seen a job posting and he said, you should apply for it. I'm like, okay, great. Yeah. And it was for an industrial hygienist position. Did and you know what that was? I didn't have a clue what it was. Yeah. I immediately started Googling what, what is industrial hygiene? Um, and so that was my industrial hygiene 101 class right there in a Google search. Um, and so I had applied for the position and I didn't end up getting the, the job, but I did get a, a technician level role. So I, that was my first job in the health and safety space was an industrial hygiene technician. And uh, I started working out here at the Hanford site. And so I'll tell you, I didn't really love that particular position, but um, all my bosses and all, all the people in management had what I call the big three. They had the master's degree, the CSP and the CIH. And so while I was working at, at, at a technician level, I started to just kind of look up what a career path is for an industrial hygienist and what's a CIH, what do, what do you got to do to get a CIH and a CSP, what kind of master's programs are out there. And so while I was working at that technician level, I had enrolled in a master's program at Montana Tech University. And that was right about the same time I took my first uh, professional level industrial hygienist role um, as a field industrial hygienist. And at that point is when I uh, kind of made the decision that I really wanted to, to take my career to the next level in the, the field of health and safety. And, and I'm glad I did. I, I, I really enjoy it. So if I was to ask you, you're seven years in now, you know, and you could be looking back with your own experiences, what do you think it takes to be a successful safety professional? You know, ever since getting into this field um, beyond a technician level, um, it seems that most projects only have, depending on the size of the project, just uh, one, two, or three health and safety professionals. And so one thing that's really helped me a lot is um, learning how to be confident and kind of trusting yourself um, because there might be three health and safety professionals to 100 uh, workers, you know, and so they really need to to trust their health and safety staff. And so I think to be a good safety professional, you need to either be confident or uh, I don't want to say fake it till you make it, but to a certain extent, you need to invoke trust in, in your in your workers. 
Um, and if not confidence, I would say persistence would be um, another word I would use to describe it because um, at the end of the day, um, your job is to implement controls to keep your workers safe. And um, a big part of that, I think most safety professionals have experienced pushback with some of that, you know, and, and so it's just really important to be confident and to, to be persistent with your control set, knowing that um, at the end of the day, you're just trying to, to keep your, your workers safe and healthy. So one of the things you just said was invoke trust in your workers. Right. So, so you're saying, so your workers trust you. I would, I would think so. Yeah. And yeah. That, that's a, big, yeah. that's a big, uh, a, a big thing that I try to um, keep in check, I guess, you know, and um, I view myself as, as a leader, right? I, I'm in a leadership position. And I think a big part of leadership is, is kind of walking the walk. Um, and so I try to lead by example. I try to be present in the field. Uh, that gets talked a lot about in the health and safety space is uh, having some boots on the ground experience. And while I can't say I have a ton of true boots on the ground experience, I try to just be present in the field. Um, I try to be out there and speaking in front of the crew. I try to level with everybody. And I think that's really important. So some of the things that you were talking to us about was leading by example and being present. Can you give some really good examples to our audience who are listening, what you've done to do that? Well, you know, we my project has about 60 workers um, and I work at a, a hazardous waste facility. So out here at the Hanford site, um, all the waste that gets generated throughout the process, it shows up to our facility. Um, it's kind of like a, like a glorified dump in a way. Um, and so, we try, me and my team, we just try to make sure that we're present and that we're seen and that we go and we ask questions. Um, our most recent kind of endeavor has been um, a safety improvement plan with an attempt to improve our safety culture here. Um, and part of that is getting people involved and, and kind of sharing the responsibility of safety with not just the safety people, the safety professionals. Um, it's the team leaders, the foreman, or whoever's in charge on that particular task um, and so we try to go out in the field and and just ask questions, have little tailgates and say, hey, what are you going to do to make this job safer? Uh, what are your responsibilities? What's your um, emergency response plan? Um, and so we really just try to share that role among our entire organization. And so we started that last October. Um, and I'd say um, on all accounts, we've seen drastic improvement in our overall safety culture. And, and a big part of it is just being present, being available, being in the field, answering questions and asking questions. So I wanted to shift a little bit. Um, we're talking a lot about the professional right now. And part of this discussion is that we want to get to know who you are, Giovanni, as a person outside of your own uh, professional realm in your industry. And so I, I wonder, is there been anybody who's been like really influential to you um, over the years that's helped kind of create who you are? Yeah, I mean, a, a real quick, easy one would be my dad. Um, ever since I can remember, you know, I grew up playing all, all kinds of sports. I played hockey growing up for most of my life. And my dad was always one to motivate me to, to, to do your best no matter what you're doing. Um, and then specifically, he he really wanted me to go and get a college degree. No, nobody in my family um, had gotten a college degree at that point. And so he always wanted us kids to go and, and, and get an education. And, and uh, so I attribute a lot of, of who I am as a person um, and a lot of my career to my dad. And never mind the fact that he also is an industrial hygienist and he's been working in the health and safety space too. Um, but aside from that, um, my dad's a runner. He's he's the guy that's known out here for running in all kinds of weather on his lunch break. And um, so I've I've picked up running and um, endurance sports and hiking and stuff. And him and I go on runs all the time together. And so, yeah, I take a lot of influence from from my dad. And great to hear a story about you said your dad was really a motivator for you. Right. Um, yeah. And one of the things that was very passionate was that you did continue your your education. Can you share a little bit about how did he motivate you to keep going? You know, my dad um, 
you know, without sharing too much information for him, but he, he had a, he had a tough upbringing. Um, he had a lot of struggles, you know, financially and, and within his personal relationships growing up. And so I think for him, he viewed going and getting a college education as kind of a way to uh, break the mold of, of, of his upbringing. And um, him and I have talked a lot about this, you know, with our, with our whole family. And um, I think for him, that was a way to just kind of break free. And, and he didn't want us to be uh, going through the same experiences that he did as a kid. You know, I, I'm thinking about what you're saying. You're saying you break the mold, do different experiences, don't do the same as as what people have been doing in the past. And that's that kind of gets me thinking about, you know, our taking it back to EHS professionals and our professional field. There's been a lot done in the past that we probably look and say, wow, we wish we could have done that a bit differently, mm -hmm. right? But now we've, we've, we're at a pivotal point in history with COVID kind of really changing the working landscape. If I was to give you a crystal ball and with everything that you've gone through so far, what do you predict would be the next big thing for us as health and safety professionals to have on our radar? Yeah, so I'm, I'm going to answer this in two ways because one will be a prediction and another will be uh, maybe a hope or what I'd like to see. Um, as for a prediction, um, I've seen a lot of young, um, young early career um, industrial hygienists and health and safety professionals, and a lot of them are coming out of school with a, a formal college degree educational background. And uh, right now with a lot of the health and safety professionals that are retiring, um, a lot of them don't have college degrees. And it's not that that's a bad thing. It's just a changing landscape. But I think with this new um, influx of younger professionals, we're going to get a little bit more of a uh, technical level, um, technically trained health and safety professionals. I think that's going to benefit um, the workforce all around overall. Um, and also, we're starting to see a lot more women in industrial hygiene and a, a different uh, diversity set of people coming in to the health and safety profession. And with, I think it's great because we're going to get health and safety advice and technical knowledge from a whole new lens. And let's face it, I think the, the I mean, the entire workforce has been predominantly white, right? And um, that's definitely changing and it's it's great to see. Um, in fact, that's what the membership advisory group with the AI, AIHA has been um, aimed on working on. Uh, some of the things that we're working on, um, it's a brand new group and I was selected as the chair of the, of the, the group. And um, so far, we're just starting from the ground up and working on projects and goals and uh, our first task as a group was to to try to find focus areas that that our group wants to uh, to focus on, and um, the three focus groups that we're going to to really put our resources on are going to be one student outreach because uh, the vast majority of the members within our group have very similar stories to mine. They just get into industrial hygiene or safety kind of by happenstance. You know, most most of us didn't go to college with hopes of being industrial hygienists. Um, but with that, I think there's a lot of students now that would make for great health and safety professionals that really aren't gonna know about the profession. And so that's something that we really wanna focus on. Um, and then another one is social media presence. Um, speaking of a younger crowd getting into industrial hygiene, uh, we really wanna improve the social media presence for the American Industrial Hygiene Association and some of their membership benefits and really try to uh, tie into um, a whole different crowd of people through social media. Um, and then the last one is about improving the diversity within our organization um, and reaching out to underserved communities. Because like I said before, it's, it's a whole different demographic and a whole new lens that we really haven't been able to tap into sufficiently yet. And so the more we can and improve our diversity and reach out to some of these underserved communities, I think it's just going to improve the health and safety organization and profession as a whole. Yeah, no, I see where you're taking this. And I think it is, it's a, 
a wonderful opportunity, a wonderful period of time. We're, we're seeing a lot more growth in individuals that we don't typically in the past have seen in health and safety roles. Mm -hmm. You know, but one of the things that I, I'm thinking about, because you because you mentioned the the increase in the technical side, is that we don't want to lose the soft skills, mm -hmm. right? Because with change and and with um with a having a variety of of different individuals, be it talking to management or talking to the workforce, you need those soft skills. Right. So how do you think we can prepare those students coming in? They have the technical skills from university and school, but also to increase their those soft skills and emotional intelligence skills. Yeah, you know, and I think uh, a big part of the, the answer to that question is going to be um, just getting the health and safety profession, just the, uh, uh, the, the basic 101 information about the entire industry out to the students so they can recognize that this is a career path that they can go down. Um, because, you know, when I was in college, uh, it seemed that most of the people in the biology program were either going for pre-med or they were going into some sort of lab sciences position where maybe the soft skills aren't as important. And if they maybe added another career path um, as a potential career, um, being industrial hygiene or health and safety professional, and they know a little bit about what the health and safety professional does, then they might be able to focus on, okay, so if I do wanna be an industrial hygienist, part of it is having the technical knowledge, but another part of it is um, public speaking, um, providing training, giving lectures, and working with a, a varying workforce of different backgrounds, ethnicity, education, and all of that. Um, and I think it all just starts with getting the health and safety profession out there to students so that they're just aware of it, that, that that's a potential career path they can go down. No, I like how you, how you're positioning that, like, let it be known that this is a career path. And then that way people can figure out what skill sets do I need to be successful? Absolutely. Right. Well, thank you very much, Giovanni, for joining us today. This has been a great conversation. I know that we're, um, at the end of our time. So before we leave, was there anything that you wanted to add? You know, I, I had mentioned I wanted to answer that question in two parts. And, and the other part to your question was, uh, what would I like to see in the health and safety space? And what I'd like to see, and I think we're, we're getting there, is somehow implementing mental health into the overarching health and safety kind of package. Because Right now, it feels like that part is, it's almost taboo in a way for some of us health and safety professionals. And uh, part of it is that um, I don't know that an industrial hygienist or a health and safety professional um, is necessarily qualified to assess somebody's mental health. Um, but I do think um, having an avenue or having some resources for our workers so that they can be heard and have some of these issues addressed, I think that would go a long way. Absolutely. And I think it's exactly what we are. We are a resource for people. Mm -hmm. So if we're going to be a resource to help eliminate and mitigate health and safety, be that health in, in the physical sense, health in the emotional sense, or health, health in psychological sense. And some people may say, well, that's all the same thing, but that's a discussion for another, another day. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, then we need to have that understanding of what resources are out there for all areas of our, our health and our safety. Yeah, absolutely. Right. And I do have a, a, a short story kind of about this. It was kind of an aha moment for me. Um, out here where we work, we do have mental health counseling available, paid for by the employer. Um, and I've known about it. And I think a lot of people do know about it, but I... I had never seen a mental health counselor. I've never seen a psychiatrist. And um, to be frank, I didn't quite feel comfortable approaching people and saying, hey, this service is available and, and free to you. And there was a worker that was here at the time, and he would come to my office and share a lot of stories that, uh, in my mind, I felt that him going and talking to a professional about it could have helped his situation. And 
Um, but I got kind of gun shy. I was, I, I just wasn't quite comfortable um, advising that to him and how to approach that conversation. And um, so my call to action from that experience was I went and started to see mental health counseling here provided at work. And one, I, I've loved the experience. And so I'd recommend it to anybody. Um, the way I look at it, it's like, you know, occasionally you got to take your car in for an oil change and they look under the hood and it doesn't mean anything's wrong. And, and that's kind of how I feel with, with mental health treatment is going to get treatment or to go talk to a professional doesn't necessarily mean there's anything wrong with you. It's just letting somebody look under the hood and just make sure everything's working okay. And if it's not, get it addressed. And um, I wish, I'd like to see that that's more, uh, more common among not just our workers, but just anybody in general. Well, and it's almost like bringing it to a place that it's normalized, mm -hmm. right? Like yeah. it's normal for a manager to come and share with you what you're doing well and what maybe they can see are challenges that need to be improved. And so the question is then why are we, if, if we say that people should value themselves, then why do we not just normalize having somebody to chat with? Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, and should we even call time. it treatment? And yeah, and you're, you're probably right. I don't know that being, it being called treatment is necessarily the case, right? I don't, I don't go get a physical from my doctor and call it treatment, you know? Um, yeah, I, I would love to see it more normalized. And uh, I think we're getting there. You know, uh, I know on social media, there's a big push for uh, mental health awareness. And I just want to see it break the break the boundaries of the workplace. Because people spend a lot of their time at work. And yeah. in reality, work it, it can absolutely contribute or exacerbate any sort of mental health issues people are going through. And um, in fact, that could be the cause of some people's mental health issues. And um, I, I do think it's our obligation as health and safety professionals to get that addressed. So absolutely. You know, some people are spending anywhere from eight to 16 hours in the workplace. Mm -hmm. So it it we know better. Our generation knows better. Yeah. Right. How you feel in your head impacts your focus and impacts your performance, impacts you being the best self that you can be. Yeah. So I'm right there with you. Mm -hmm. And I think we're doing a disservice as health and safety professionals that that we don't share resources like that. I remember um, in one place I I worked. Um, I had somebody who was having some pain. So I brought in a, a therapist, a physiotherapist to work out stretches and stuff. And then other people saw that this, this woman was getting, getting this treatment. And they're like, wait a minute, why doesn't she come to our department too? Cause we've got pains. So then that, that's what started to happen is like, she kind of started making this rounds to the different departments and people started talking to her about different things, like, you know, that were giving them pain. And it just became normal. Like, mm -hmm. hey, when 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 she comes, send her over to, to this department because yeah. we want to talk to her too. And I remember we had a, a death in our workplace and we had a counselor come to be there, a grief counselor. And so many staff went to that grief counselor mm -hmm. and shared their pain with her right about this the worker that had died in the work in our workplace and it wasn't a workplace related death but it was still somebody from the team that mm -hmm. had been there I, I believe the woman had been there something like 35 years whatever mm -hmm. and so it was like losing a family member yeah. to a lot of the people and, and that needs to be taken seriously for sure when it goes back to what you'd said about just normalizing it you know once once people are talking about it a little bit more and they recognize that, you know, they might not be alone in maybe having some mental health issues. Um, they're not alone in it and it becomes normalized. Then we can start having the conversation and, and really making some, making some changes. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much for uh, sharing your time with us today. This has been a great conversation. Yeah. Thank you, Tamara. I really appreciate it. And uh, thank you all for listening. This has been really fun. Yeah, thank you. And if you're looking for more great content, visit us on safepedia.com because we have more podcasts and this podcast will also be put up there. 
and you'll be able to uh, connect with Giovanni because I'll put his information there as well. So thank you, everybody. Great, thank you.